So, uh, yeah, I know it's getting late and, uh, you know, more talks, but I, I think we should uh, get started here. I, I think in the, in, the, uh, in the United States we have the term ICU. I don't think you guys call it ICU here. You do call it ICU? Okay. Well, of course, we know that's a euphemism for uh, the intensive complication unit. So it's, I think, important to, to, I mean, I teach my fellows that what you really want to do is stop the complications. You know, because, you know, the problem is the complications sort of uh, add on to your patient's problem. In fact, many patients uh, end up dying in the ICU not because of their original admission. It's because of the uh, complications that sort of go down the drain. Now, if we look at this going down the drain a little bit more carefully, you can see that, uh, and I think we're all faced with this, patients are getting older, more comorbidities, at least in the States. I can't imagine it wouldn't be similar here. But you got this outer ring of comorbidities, older age, and then you keep circling the drain here, and you see that the ventilator is right in the middle of all that. And it's really hard to know cause and effect here, but obviously the ventilator has a lot of uh, role in, in chronic critical illness, which I would argue we don't have a good answer for yet. I think we're much better in acute care than, than this. And of course, this means that the, I call this, it's a chemotactic factor. Uh, ventilator undesirable chemotactic factor. In other words, there's so many things that are coming to you, your patient, because they're on the ventilator. Of course, I made that up. You know, it's not even, it's not real. But it's a really a gateway drug to chronic illness. The ventilator itself. So I think it's important to to look at the ventilator from slightly different perspectives. Sometimes we just get uh, used to looking at it from the perspective of gas exchange mechanics and so on. And so this is. Uh, you could argue it's the devil, it's the instrument of the devil. And what I mean by that is that this is us on rounds. You know, because something like this, I'm rounding with a fellow and they do the systematic review of the patient, you know, and they get to pulmonary or respiratory and they say, uh, stable respiratory, they give you the blood gases that are acceptable and then they say, stable, no changes for respiration. So in other words, we're admiring the blood gas and so you could easily be lulled to feeling confident and comfortable that you've got a good blood gas. And clearly the system is a little more complicated, there's a little more to it than just the blood gas. So I think I want to explore the fact that there's a whole other uh, fancy system. Now without getting into a lot of great details, but if you're on the ventilator in, the, in this sort of big meta-analysis, it's not good to be on the ventilator, basically. And if you look at the one-year survival, it's pretty low high 50s, 60s uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, mortality. So I think we all have an interest in maybe getting our patients off the ventilator as quickly as possible. And you know, one of my thoughts is as soon as you're intubating someone, as you're pushing that tube down, you should have the thought cross your mind, how am I gonna get this person off the ventilator? So I think there's no time to be wasted and the sooner you can work your patient towards that, the better. Now, obviously there's a lot of things involved that we do in the ICU. We don't necessarily give people good nutrition and there's obviously sedation, sedation, and it's hard to know sedation cause and effect. I mean, we use sedation all the time uh, and we, we already know that, well, you know, sedation does have an impact on ventilator days and outcome. It's, I mean, that's not new information. I don't know if it's because of sedation or because of mechanical ventilation needing sedation. I don't know that we'll, we'll actually figure that out completely. But now what I want to talk about is does the ventilator itself create a situation where we take the muscular ventilator and we pretty much complicate it. So by the time we're done with all the acute illness, we're now going to make sure the patient does not come off in a timely fashion. And you know what happens when they stay on the ventilator. More things, this is sort of the bad chemotactic factor. Many bad things can happen to the patient. Now, I do want to make the distinction here between a problem with the, with the diaphragm or the respiratory muscles, and collectively we'll call this ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction, which is, uh, I guess, the main term we're using. Uh, but there's a difference between general weakness in the ICU or acquired weakness in the ICU. And if you just look at it, uh, well, this is obviously busy, but let's just look at this. If you look at the final 76 patients in this study, uh, the ones that had diaphragm dysfunction versus no diaphragm, the majority of them did not have ICU-associated weakness. So this was almost 
uh, essentially um, uh, patients who have diaphragmatic dysfunction. And over on this side, the ones without diaphragm dysfunction, well, many of them did not have that. So it seems like it, this could be two separate things. And based on the way the muscles, uh, the diaphragm, even though it is a skeletal muscle, it sort of has a slightly different purpose than, say, conventional skeletal muscle. And maybe there's a breakdown that occurs much more rapidly in those muscles. Uh, and you can see that uh, that did translate into weaning and see the ones that had diaphragm dysfunction definitely had prolonged weaning, difficult weaning versus how much they had, had simple weaning than just sort of general ICU weakness. Now just a quick uh, history, a review on ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction. Again, I would say this is something that uh, it's still not fully mature. So everything I'm saying is kind of giving you a, an overview. And then there's a lot of interplay with what we do on a daily basis. But very quickly, the, the first, uh, this is a human study. This was kind of first noted in the neonatal population. And then we had sort of laboratory investigations about diaphragm weakness. And here you could elaborate more on the biochemistry and trying to understand what happens with mechanical ventilation. And eventually we got to 2008, and I don't know if you recall this, this was a study done in brain dead donors. Uh, and they looked at their muscles versus someone not. And that was kind of important. They looked at various things. And now we're sort of, obviously, this goes to 2013. There's been some additional data. Uh, and anytime you see a graph like this, you know, maybe we should start reading about it <laughs> because the literature is going up. So more and more things are likely to come out of this area uh, just simply because of the, how impactful the ventilator is on everything ICU days, your morbidity, mortality. Um, now, this is kind of normal, this is the reference point, and you can, you start with cross-sectional areas. I mean, that's basically how this started, was the observation of cross-sectional area of the diaphragm M muscle fibers are less. Here's the human study similarly showing that, and then there's the diaphragm thickness, which, you know, the correlation and the actual pressure the diaphragm can generate, none of this is exactly perfect, but there seems to be a correlation with all of this. And as you can see here, um, you have a, a decline in the force that you can generate and the twitch pressure. This is pressure at the airway and at maximal stimulation to see how much the uh, pressure changes. Just very quickly, the, the diaphragm uh, pathology biochemically seems to be related to reactive oxygen species. And that sort of sends a signal to sort of break down uh, the muscle, and these things are very important. This is the uh, pathway to break down muscle and actually leads to atrophy. And this happens very quickly. And based on the studies, this, this is happening while you're sort of comfortably ventilating your patient and happy their blood gases are okay. Uh, of course, this is just an example of what ultimately happens. You, you thin the diaphragm and it, it ends up breaking uh, its ability to actually generate force. Just very briefly, these, there's so many different ways that people have looked at monitoring, measuring, and so on. And it's, again, one of those things that I think for us, we need to just be aware of this as the first step. It's almost like uh, first step to knowing there's a problem is be aware of it. So we're going to be aware of it, and there are ways to measure it. Um, and some of these are, uh, you know, probably the most popular one, at least in the States, currently is, is ultrasound and looking at diaphragm thickness. I would just say that that's not a perfect correlation with the pressure uh, that it generates. Uh, here's the study that was done. This is in neonates. And again, you can see this is 47 days of mechanical ventilation since birth. And this is a, a, a baby that died at three days postnatal, never on the ventilator. So you can see the cross-sectional area difference. And again, is that because of the ventilator? Who knows? This is the study I mentioned about uh, the Levine uh, tr uh, study where they looked at they looked at ventilation. Here's the case versus the control. Uh, two to three hours of mechanical ventilation versus 18. And you can see the, uh, the rapid and the, the red is the slow muscle fibers. And again, the twitch, you can see that there is a difference between the two for both types of muscle fibers. So it seems to be. Uh, affecting the ability of the diaphragm, which of course is the major inspiratory muscle uh, uh, in terms of that. They also looked at atrogen and MRF. These are again sort of 
pro, they signal to break down muscle. And this is uh, obviously elevated in a lot of these cases. Now that's, of course, organ donors. I always a question whether there's something about organ donation, brain injury, who knows, uh, that uh, would affect this. So this study, I think, is important because this is just critically ill patients. So this is human study, critically ill, and they pretty much found the same exact thing, that you have uh, the control group, the critically ill. This is sort of uh, staining so that you can see the blue is sort of the fast muscle, muscle fibers. Uh, you also have the same sort of translation in terms of the force generated. What they also found was some infiltration, which over here is showing almost an inflammatory response in the diaphragm. In other words, neutrophils are increased in versus control. So that's kind of an interesting thing. This is also looking at uh, other skeletal muscle, so non-respiratory in the same patients, and you can see there's really no change. So again, there's something about the respiratory muscles that sort of makes them decline at a rate that's probably three times more than skeletal muscle, you know, limb muscle. Uh, some people look at the pec muscle. Um, and again, more of the biochemical signaling that you need to break down. And this is sort of the Western blot you can see here. The critically ill patients have more uh, MRF and, and uh, uh, other sort of ligases that break down protein, basically. They target them for breakdown. The force, again, in this study, very similar. So it seems as though there's some pathophysiology that's occurring uh, related to, to perhaps the ventilator, maybe to intensive care in general, but trying to sort that out. Now, this study looked at outcome, and this is a, whoops, a more recent trial, 2018, but here they, they did this by ultrasound, and they found that as the diaphragm thins, it thins every day, day one of mechanical ventilation, all the way down to uh, where they looked for four days, and they correlated that with uh, uh, increased uh, longer time on the ventilator and outcome. And this is what they found was kind of interesting. Uh, your ability to extubate the patient goes down as the diaphragm thins and goes up as it stays normal, no change. And then, of course, as it thickens, which is kind of interesting, also, similarly, you had a problem. Now, why does the diaphragm thicken? Not really sure, but maybe there's an inflammatory response, and certainly there are more and more people are documenting an, uh, an inflammatory reaction in the, in the muscle from the breakdown from reactive oxygen species and so on. If you look at some of the studies, uh, you know, this is a summary. I wouldn't, um, again, the data, we're not talking about huge amounts of data yet, uh, but it's a problem that if if they're anywhere near these numbers, it's something we need to be aware of. If people are developing uh, dysfunction 64% uh, within 24 hours, 80 during their course of their stay, and of course, th there's more and more data suggesting this is what happens. Remember, this is still the major inspiratory muscle that uh, occurs. So parking someone on the ventilator may not be a good idea. Admiring and finding comfort in their blood gas on a daily basis may not be a good idea. Maybe we need to do something more. Um, you now, we talked about this, which is basically over assistance. That's what I mean by watching the patient. It's actually, they're not ventilating, they're just being inflated and deflated, perhaps, with what a machine does. Human breathing is a little more sophisticated, uh, but they're not really doing anything. But um, there's under assistance also. In other words, what if we don't have the ventilator set correctly and now the patients are, you know, have a lot of effort? Remember that we always. Uh, we look at the blood gas, we look at the ventilator. At some point, we have to get back to looking at the patient. And of course, there's a lot underneath. It's like the iceberg. There's so much in the respiratory system that is far beyond that, that we have to worry about these patients. And then we have this uh, ability to having ventilators that are not, are off sync. So we've got a muscular ventilator and we've got a, a ventilator that's driven by electricity. So they may not always uh, work well together, and you may have eccentric uh, myotrauma, which the patient is exhaling, uh, the diaphragm is relaxing, and you get an inspiration, for example. But obviously, any triggering asynchrony could lead to some uh, disjointed interaction between the ventilators that you have in the room, two ventilators in the room. 
And of course, there's this idea that you can stretch the muscles by having higher PEEP and then dropping the PEEP rapidly. So there's some data on that as well. Again, this is sort of experimental. Um, so, but what do we do? What do we do? I mean, on one hand, I should go to the ICU and stop sedating everyone and let everyone just breathe because maybe we should let them use their muscles to breathe. Maybe we'd stop all the atrophy if we did that. Um, or, and that would probably solve the problem of over-assisting the patients, but then we have this problem over here. If we don't support them enough, they're gonna have excessive worker breathing, and we're back into the same place again. So we're, this is really not solvable by just simply doing the extremes of over-sedating people or stopping everything. And of course, that's always easy. Of course, the harder thing is to figure out what the right thing to do, which I don't know what the right thing to do is, but we can look at some of the information that's out there, and what we do know is that pressure support's a common way to address this, uh, or AS, ASV, right, uh, is common because it's a spontaneous mode of ventilation. I would argue it's only triggered by the patient. The rest of it is, has nothing to do with human breathing at all. And uh, if you look, it's not any different uh, in terms of the diaphragm function. After uh, These are hours of ventilation. This is done with a rat. Rat models seem to be the best in terms of they just are closely matched to the way the human diaphragm works. I don't know why that is, but. Uh, so you can see that with pressure support, it's not much better than conventional controlled ventilation. So if you want people to breathe, maybe pressure support isn't the ex example you want. Now, if you do unassisted breathing or CPAP, remember CPAP is, is essentially breathing at a different platform. Uh, it doesn't seem to be one day of uh, CMV three days versus one day versus three days of CPAP, and here's control. So it seems to mitigate this. And actually some newer studies suggest you don't have to have them fully breathing, that you need some partial degree, exactly how much, not really clear, but you need some kind of partial uh, use of the muscular ventilator to keep this from happening. And again, this is just more uh, information about the force generated by the diaphragm over time. This is a, a recent paper, and it was, again, these are not injured lungs, so, you know, I think that changes things also. But let's just look at uh, maintenance of spontaneous breathing. So they're using pressure control here. And what they're doing is they're changing how much pressure control. So 100% pressure control or setting pressure control with no support. So zero. And as you can see here, that over time, the cross-sectional area obviously uh, changes. And you can see that if you use no pressure control versus 20%, 40%, obviously the worst in terms of cross-sectional areas if you completely control ventilation. And in a similar fashion, they looked at the pressure generated by the diaphragm, the Pmax, and the ratio of the two, and you can see just generally a trend that the more you're controlling ventilation versus not ventilating the patient or supporting the patient, letting them use their muscular ventilator, the, uh, the better it is. And in terms of the breakdown of muscle, the things that sort of tag the muscles to, to undergo atrophy and autophagia, uh, the levels go up with this. And so that's obviously clear. We just need to put everyone on CPAP. Uh, well, the problem is, of course, we have this problem. I mean, again, sedation. Why do we use sedation? This is all sort of the bad things that come along with the ventilator. It's got a lot of bad friends, let's put it that way. And so this is still a problem. In fact, I would argue that we see this a lot. Uh, I know that when I come into the ICU many times, the patient, everyone's happy that the SATs are okay. But I look at the patient, I'm going, is the patient been breathing like this? How long has the patient been breathing like this? And you see they just look terrible. They're using obvious uh, muscles of distress and so on. So this is a big problem, and it's an unrecognized problem, certainly. Um, so we need, we need a better understanding of what to do here. But I don't think we're at the point where we can just cover all this up which is sedation and paralytics, because we'll pay for it later. So that's currently what we do. We conform the patient to our ventilator. You know, here's the settings you get. You don't like it, I'm gonna paralyze you, basically. And hopefully I've sedated you also. Uh, but we need to think about it a little bit more. Now again, I'm not pretending that I have any answers here, but there's probably a few things we can at least think about. Um, and in fact, I would just say that um, 
we're now seeing, you know, PTSD, and this is one of the big problems is you can't breathe. It's one of the most invoking things of sort of fear, terror, anxiety is not being able to breathe. So if we look at sort of this dyspnea problem, uh, it happens a lot and seems to occur a lot in assist control, which is a very common mode, certainly in the United States. Uh, low tidal volume, I mean, just naturally dyspnea, the counter to dyspnea is taking big breaths. That's what people do when they feel dyspnea. That's the normal reaction to it. And it's worse than the most breathless exercise you've had in terms of people uh, that are surveyed. Low PEEP has an effect, and you know we can get into why PEEP would be a uh, consideration. And of course, you can certainly flow starve your patient, uh, but you can't give them too much flow either. And so back to the thick diaphragm again, and believe me, I am not saying that everyone should breathe and we should ignore silly, whatever that is. I never liked that term, to be honest with you. But anyway, we obviously don't want the patient breathing at all cost, and so on. And so it comes down to, can we make it safer? How do we, it seems as though we need to have the patient engage in, re-engage their, their muscular ventilator as soon as possible without hurting them. And so how do we actually do that? And uh, I think one of the things we could do is uh, go back to the ancients because they were, in my opinion, a lot wiser. Uh, but anyway, let's, <laughs> Let's just think about this for a second. And, you know, I, I had a, a, one of my mentors always said this. Whenever you approach medicine, you always have to think about this. What are you doing? Who are you doing it to? When are you doing it to? All these things become relevant. I mean, these are just basic questions to sort of problem solve. But I want to talk about the how. You know, because we're stuck with the ventilator. The question is, is there any way to tune the ventilator so that we can get people to use their muscles without having a a lot of problems and of course you know we can monitor there's a lot to discuss about monitoring but let's just say you want to be um, more practical about it so one of the things that we know is you cannot just admire the tidal volume you cannot sit there and look at volume control and say this patient is doing well and their blood gases confirm that uh, you know one of the things you'll see is that the volume ventilation has negative proportionality in other words the more effort the patient makes the less the machine does. And just as an analogy, I don't have pure volume control. This is auto flow, which is PRVC, but this also has negative proportionality. And you can see it here, is that the patient is not getting a tidal volume. There's no pressure above the peep because they're drastically pulling down. And this is sort of the iceberg. Uh, there's a lot going on beneath there. What is the patient doing? And uh, to some extent, you can see the relaxation volume that Luigi was talking about. This is, if you ever have a patient who's respiratory stress on volume ventilation and you're about to intubate, the, I'm sorry, you're about to paralyze them, watch what happens to their airway pressure. You're going to see what, what their pleura was doing. It's going to transfer to the airway approach because now you're just pushing because they're pulling while they're pushing. So it just sits there and its output decreases. So as your patient gets more distressed, it's a problem. And I think I have a video. It's just a terrible video. I apologize. But you can see... The, the airway pressure, oh, it's just, this is terrible. Well, I think you can sort of see that, you know, when they relax, they get a tidal volume. When, when they make a really hard effort, there's no tidal volume above the peep. They're moving all the volume. They're moving the volume because as the ventilator is set for a certain volume, if they're pulling tw above that or twice that, the machine's not going to add a pressure on top of that. So as the patient gets worse, they're making more effort. And... One of the things that we might want to think about is the idea of proportionality. And this is a PMOS and carbon dioxide. And just very quickly, this is a cyst control. The more the patient does, the less the machine does. And the only way to sort of help them stop breathing is perhaps get to the point where they're no longer having a ventilatory demand. At least that's one of them. But there is no sort of, and same, this is sort of unassisted breathing. You can see here. Now, obviously, if you had better healthy lungs, the slope would be higher. You know, obviously, it shifts over as you get stiff lungs. So, but proportionality might be important. So, unassisted spontaneous CPAP has proportionality. The more effort the patient makes, the more they get. But they may not get enough support. Maybe because their elastins is so high that they need a little boost. 
but we'd like something to start here and support the patient. So maybe it's possible to do that rather than using pressure support because it's really hard to use pressure support and tune it to the point where you're not over assisting or under assisting. And as I said, it looks as though we can make mistakes in both directions. So proportionality becomes an, a human element of breathing that might be important. When you go jogging, you're going to increase your ability to draw air in, flow, volume, all those things go up. Uh, so it's related to your effort. And so you can see here in pressure support, you have um, on this upper one, here's the diaphragm. It's pretty silent. Even though you're getting your tidal volume, you just need to trigger it and the machine just does what it wants to do. Or, you know, and there's a, a lot of asynchronies that can occur. So reverse triggering, uh, you know, all of these things may actually be harmful uh, for the ventilator. Now, what's the role of PEEP? Well, PEEP uh, is interesting because if you use less PEEP, and uh, this is uh, uh, from Yoshida, and he, he's done a couple of articles or about studies about you know, PEEP levels, he found the opposite to be true when you use high PEEP. And part of that is, you know, when you're using higher PEEP, you're, you may not have as much air hunger, and maybe resolving the air hunger might be important. It's kind of interesting that if you look at the ROSE trial, if you're familiar with the ROSE trial, this is uh, paralytic use. I'm trying to answer that question because do paralytics help in ARDS? I, I don't know if we know exactly, but they're, the patients are slightly different. Maybe they're not as sick, but they found that the patients were definitely on a higher PEEP strategy, and they found that if they were breathing, they, they, there was no difference in terms of their uh, spontaneous breathing that it didn't seem to be harmful by any measure. Um, and of course, this is uh, another paper from Yoshida just talking about using PEEP as a safe way to spontaneously breathe. Now again, like anything else, you can use too much PEEP. You can use too little PEEP. That's a whole nother discussion how to figure that out. But, but basically what's important is, and this is important is that if you have high respiratory drive, you don't want a diaphragm that has maximum curve in it. So if your lung volume is below a certain level, you've got maximum curve in the diaphragm and you can generate uh, a lot of force. And so you obviously have the ability to create much more pleural pressure change without PEEP. So the higher your PEEP is, maybe that's better. Of course, more even distribution of stress strain, better gas exchange. Certainly there's a lot of things that drive uh, distress, which are gas exchange related and, and so on. And if you look, this is uh, pleural pressure, sorry, Where's pleural pressure? There's pleural pressure esophageal, and you can see uh, esophageal pressure, pleural, pleural pressure. When you increase the PEEP, you can see that the effect, uh, you know, the function on pressure change, pleural pressure change goes down. Even in uh, healthier patients, it seems to decrease phrenic nerve output, that the higher end expiratory lung volume. In fact, you will, there's a reflex, of course, that if you take a big breath, you'll so not only slow your heart rate down, but you slow the desire to ventilate. So that might be important. Now coming back to the asynchronies, and again, I, I don't know, do you guys routinely look for asynchrony? I know you do. <laughs> well, it's not so easy to, to, to track, and you know, it's one of those things. My guess is there's a lot of asynchrony going on out there that we're not even aware of. And so the question, if that causes more problems of communicating or interacting with these two ventilators to work together well, then we could have a problem. And you know, even if we don't, we can just indirectly look at what happens when you have asynchrony. And this is using the asynchrony index. I mean, generally the data suggests that longer duration, less likely to be successfully weaned. You know, so I, I don't know if it's cause and effect here, but either way, you're on the ventilator longer, which we don't want. So perhaps working on asynchronies is a good idea, and you know, just in the uh, in the um, pressure support data, it seems like there's a lot of asynchrony in pressure support. Uh, if you look at the literature, that you know, again, you could probably get it right. I know you can get pressure support right. I think I've done that a couple of times, but at the moment. <laughs> but as soon as you leave, it's a whole other situation. In fact, uh, if you just think about human breathing, we do not breathe in a monotonal fashion. You can't confine human breathing to a tidal volume and a rate. It fluctuates. The same thing happens to your patient. When you're at home, uh, they're breathing differently, perhaps. And so underneath that, 
safety of the ventilator, there may be a lot going on that we're just not aware of. So I think we need to consider that. Now, I think this is one of the problems, and I think if you want to at least start to understand what the ventilator is doing, you can't look at the respiratory system as a blood gas. You have to look beyond that. And so we have to worry about the, uh, the whole idea of dyspnea and what happens here with pain and emotions and all kinds of things that we do to people in the ICU. We make them hear things. They panic all the time. But the whole, s the whole brainstem control of breathing is relying on this feedback system, which is becoming very important. We have a bunch of mechanical receptors. Of course, we have chemical receptors hydrogen, obviously oxygen, and, and CO2, all these things are feeding back to the brainstem. And this is why I think even in our non-invasive discussion this morning, it becomes important to, to understand what is the patient doing? Did they respond to your therapy? Because if they don't, then we can have problems. And of course, we're, we're all the way here. A lot of times we're just talking about this. The equation, of or what was their elastins, their compliance, their PEEP, all that. But all this starts up here, at least when you're talking about breathing. And you've got this uh, feedback system, which is sort of oscillatory because it's trying to sort of understand, update information. And then, it's, of course, it's gated. It can turn on and off. And, of course, the respiratory centers, more than one, there's a couple that inhibit and activate. Uh, and, of course, it's going to fire off to the, neural, the, the motor neurons through the uh, um, phrenic nerve. So this is the phrenic nerve, and you're looking at the slope of over time of that output. And of course, it has to get to the muscle and the diaphragm. And of course, the, now the diaphragm uh, activity has to be translated into a pressure over time. And that instantaneous pressure over time really depends on this whole system. And we need to figure out how we can get a, a simple ventilator mode, which uses a trigger. I mean, the modes we're using are quite old, and we're using a trigger um, that is not very sophisticated. This is the idea of engaging with the patient. You know, obviously during the polio epidemic when we went from iron lungs to um, positive pressure ventilation, those patients weren't really breathing, so it wasn't really an issue. You, you had to sort of inflate for them. But now if you want both ventilators to work together, that's a problem. Now, we can look at this uh, uh, the hyperbola here of, you know, this is basically carbon dioxide. We really move our lungs for carbon dioxide. You know, obviously oxygen will just diffuse across a gradient, but we have to physically move or ventilate. And so carbon dioxide has a big role in this. And obviously the shape of this is going to depend on how much carbon dioxide we're producing and how much uh, dead space we have. So for whatever curve you want, you're going to have to have a higher minute ventilation to maintain that PCO2. So if you've got a lot of dead space, you got a lot of uh, CO2 production, combination of two, you're going to have to ventilate more. And so I think what we want to know is, besides this slope here of this patient, let's just say this is the patient, and obviously going up on dead space or CO2 production versus lowering it uh, may have an effect on where these two intersect. And obviously we can change the mechanics of the lung, you know, normal shift it this way, abnormal shift it this way. But I think we have to understand what does the brain want? So you might want to consider looking at it perhaps this perspective. So I think the, these, uh, this paper does, uh, I think, a nice job of trying to illustrate that. If your brain curve and the ventilation output are on the same slope, then your patient is actually comfortable. The problem is we look at their output, but we don't understand their brain curve. So obviously, if we just take an example here of this patient in a steady metabolic state, they start off here, something happens, their elastins increases. So whatever output they were using for the ventilation, their minute ventilation is going to drop. The PCO2 goes up. The brain obviously gets distressed. CO2 goes up. And it demands a minute ventilation up here. And then eventually it can bring that down after it adapts. But this is the disconnect between the brain and the uh, ventilation curve. What does the system actually output? And that becomes an important thing uh, for us to consider. Now. I think this is a little bit, uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to torture you with this, but suffice it to say that this is the normal uh, unassisted slope here in all these. And if you look at assist control, again, if this is the red line is the lower level of assist control support, this is the upper level, let's say. And you, in order to get sort of to, to reset the brain, 
you have to be at baseline at a PCO2 that is lower than what the brain wants. And then the system sort of becomes quiet. Same thing happens with pressure support. On the lower end, your patient is at an equilibrium point here where the brain wants up here and eventually it'll settle out here. But if you increase the support, you will obviously not have enough. Now here, with proportional modes or unassisted modes, this is CPAP, we, we always can go to the baseline. We're never above the baseline for ventilation. In other words, the minute ventilation, again, if you're on too much pressure support, which is good because you don't want to under support them, but now you're over supporting them because a little trigger gives them a big volume. But proportionality becomes really important here. And it's the only thing that changes the slope. So again, if, you, if your unassisted effort does this, well, if I amplify your effort, I can move the slope over rather than trying to make you work in parallel or have no proportionality at all. Which leads me to cell phones. <laughs> okay, cell phones. <laughs> now, these cell phones, obviously you wouldn't want this cell phone. You probably want that cell phone. But technology has really changed quite a bit. And for whatever reason, we're still using modes from the 70s and 80s. We're still doing that. I'm not sure why. Everyone loves technology. So I always take the phones away from the fellows when they don't want to use different modes. Because ventilators are actually less mechanical and more computers. They signal process much faster and so on. So here's a ventilator from, went to Siberia. This is from Stalin's era, 1950. You control the, the rate. The tidal volume is fixed by these bellows. That's it, you get a rate knob. So it would be really hard to create a, a sort of synergy between uh, both pumps. Now that's 1950. This is 2019 in someone's garage. Yeah. Actually, this is 2019 in, in an engineer at Northrop Grumman. We, uh, the DOD contacted us to build a ventilator during COVID. And this is the ventilator we built. Because we were supposed to make 8,000 of these in a month. And uh, you can see this just goes up and down. There's a piston here. Uh, the, the, the RFP was, it had to be 300 US. You had to make it with stuff from Home Depot. You, U.S. dollars, uh, you could not source anything from China. So that was sort of what we tried. And we actually ventilated a sick, full pig uh, with severe ARDS on this ventilator. There's just water here. It's just valves, you know, water. It's just a transport ventilator. Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> but now, of course, we were desperate at COVID and thought, you know, everything was going to, but you would never want to breathe on something like this. I mean, this would be horrific. It's a piston that doesn't care about anything. It just moves back and forth at some cycle. So what we do know about proportional modes, and again, I, I can only talk about PAV only because I use it. I can't talk about NAVA in the sense that I've never really used it. I read about it, but I've never really used it. But it doesn't really matter the PAV-NAVA thing. It's really more of its proportionality and our ability to use proportionality because technically the, the ventilator is far more, it's just a better device. It can interact with the patient better. We're, we're leveraging the technology that's in the ventilator rather than being stuck on modes where the fanciest thing was a trigger, the idea of a trigger during microprocessing times of the ventilator. So many of the studies show when you compare it to pressure support, there's at least less asynchrony and there's those proportionalities that become uh, important and maybe there could be some potential benefit uh, uh, to using something like this. Um, <laughs> very lastly, just uh, it's all pretty generic stuff. And again, I'm not saying that uh, there's a lot of hard science. I think there's enough science here to make us wonder what we're doing on a day to day basis. And regardless, we should always try to get our patients off the ventilator sooner rather than later. And I think. Uh, that should start, that planning should start from the very beginning of intubation, figure out how to get them off. So again, we want them to breathe, but not to the point where they hurt themselves or actually have the opposite problem on the diaphragm, the myotrauma from over, over under assisting the patient. There are some experimental data that suggests that, um, you know, approaching uh, either with growth hormone or actually there's, there's more data on uh, um, you know, using antioxidants like uh, N-acetylcysteine that could work. I mean, the, the very small animal data s seems pretty promising. There's the whole uh, diaphragm pacing 
I don't know if you've seen that data. Uh, Animal-wise, that looked pretty good. I think the human trial is still not very impressive. Um, so, and it, personally, I'm not against uh, pacing, but I would say, well, the system's already built for you to use it. I think we, we could start by just using the natural system just more effectively. If we couldn't do that, then maybe that's the uh, consideration. But just even changing the ventilator mode to something that interacts with the patient more precisely might be better. And so uh, at the end, I'll just tell you that you don't want this. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I've tortured you guys enough, but thank you for listening.